Welcome into another episode of First of the Floor. Ben Vallis here. Thank you for joining us. Hope you're doing well. Hope you are uh, enjoying life as a Celtics fan after yet another blowout and the Celtics' 60-second win. Wayne Spoonie and Jake Eisenberg are here to talk about the biggest who-gives-a-shit game of the year as the Celtics win 124-117. to 117. Spoonie, Jake, how's it going, guys? Mate, Massive living the dream. Yeah. Living the dream. <laughs> living the dream. This is what Adrenaline. it's all about. Adrenaline pumping after that huge stay ready oh. crew uh, resurgence. I I was like at a point where I was like, you know what? Give me the playoffs. I'm I'm bored. The stay ready crew, man. They got me back in. I can I can live the sweet life. I'm while I was watching Bucks Knicks. They're like beating the shit out of each other, like fighting for their playoff lives, and we're just like <laughs> playing our third stringers and still racking up Ws. It's Yucking like it up with Tilden yeah. Banks in a three, like everybody's <laughs> yeah. goofing around. <laughs> I, I almost want to start with the Tillman stuff, um, but we won't. Let's start with, I guess, just the, the key takeaways from the game. Like for me, Jalen Brown returns. We're all looking very closely at his left hand, looking mm. for signs of life or, or the otherwise. And uh, it looked pretty good, Spoonie, I thought, in this one. What do you think of JB's performance in this game? Yeah, I didn't see a lot of shaking. He did a few claps towards the ref when he was despondent at the lack of a call, which I think is a good sign when you're just like, you're willing to clap with that left hand. Um, He didn't have, like, the Blazers are not a team that's going to, like, test Jalen's handle with, like, the left hand and see if it's weak. But I thought he looked totally fine. 10K career points, I think, I saw on Twitter right right before. Yeah. Uh, So congrats on 10K. But it's a tidy game, and I I don't have any injury worries. We got, like – Joe did like the classic coach quote after last game where it's like, here's nothing to worry about. You know, he's hurt, but there's nothing to worry about. And it's like, well, I'm going to fucking worry Joe because you just said like he's hurt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's funny. The, the role reversal has been completed because I'm usually the, the guy who's like, everything's fine. No injuries. Play the guy's minutes. And I'm for watching the game. Just Sapruta filming Jalen's left hand. I don't know why he's playing. He dunked with his left hand at one point, and he looked immediately down, mm. but he was fine. He made, I think he made all his free throws. Free so my three. new, my working, my working theory is that the the, the hand has actually fixed his free throws. The so guide can, hand. Yeah, the Love guide it. hand. He doesn't want to touch it, so it's just it's he's it's just a, rocking it. Yeah. Solid theory. I like it. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you and, and knock you off your, your course of, of Jalen takes there, Jake. Uh, oh, no, anything no. Anything else? No, you're good. I'm just I'm just seeing if I can if I can track this to see if the if he is better at the free throw line or not. Um, he is since the Pelicans game. He went two for three against the Thunder, and what was he today? Four for four. Three for three. Three for three. I don't know. You tell me. That's five for six. That's pretty good if you give me that for the rest of the playoffs. I think I think we can confirm <laughs> Jalen's free throws have been fixed and he looks great. Yeah, as far as like 10 for 17 games go for Jalen Brown, kind of rocky. A little bit of some errant passes and yeah, just a, yeah. but 10 for 17 is 10 for 17, so that's all that really matters. So if the free throws start to plummet again, do we need a, a back of the locker room, good fellas, hammer on the mm. hand situation? Just Tony bang Harding. up that hand a little bit. <laughs> yeah, Tony <laughs> Harding. <laughs> Book me a flight to Boston immediately. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jalen, it was nice to see Jalen back on the court and looking, for the most part, good. A little rusty to, to begin the game there, but he found his rhythm, as did the rest of the team, where we were out offensive rebounded. Just looking at the box score here, 22 to 5. And yet we actually out-rebounded the team uh, overall, out-rebounded the Blazers rather overall. But they out-offensive rebounded the shit out of us. But in the second quarter, (laughs) we just started hitting like every three-point attempt in this game. That kind of blew it open. Yada, yada, yada. Stay Ready Crew comes in to end the game. And um, they they keep the momentum going. If anything, they push that out even further. Um, And make for an interesting conversation around... I'm really jumping around here, guys. But make for a really interesting conversation around Joe Mazzola's Coach of the Year 
mm. candidacy. Like, what else does he have to prove, right? If he's getting the Stay Ready crew playing at this level, they've got X, the new guy, hitting game winners against the Kings. We've got him coming in and hitting corner threes, doing DHOs, well executing on, on a, at a very high level on many different offensive fronts. Uh, and really, he's got that crew playing incredibly well. So I would ask you, Spoonie, does that, do you think that boosts his Coach of the Year candidacy at all? So I, I just checked on a betting app not to mm-hmm. be named on this program. Uh, mm. He's jumped to plus 6,000. Yeah. He was like all of a sudden. around like 800 or 1,000 at one point. So I don't know what the hell happened, but wow. it friggin' should. They're going to win 65 games. Like, mm. how can you not be the coach of the year when your team wins 65 games? Like, our, uh, we're well past our over. I mean, I got our over at 54 and a half before the K or after the KP trade, before the Drew Holiday trade. So, like, people acting like, well, the Celtics were supposed to be a 60-plus win juggernaut that has one of the best net ratings ever. Bullshit. Bullshit. People were talking, oh, like, KP's not going to fit yep. in. He's always hurt. Blah, 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 blah. I guess it doesn't even matter if Porzingis is hurt because Joe has every single guy on the entire damn roster ready to play at a moment. So, Sfima High Luke looks like yes. Clay Thompson out there flying off screens, <laughs> yes, pulling up driving closeouts, kicking the ball, playing great offense, and not totally getting smashed defensively. Peyton Pritchard, Scoot Henderson, eat your heart out, dude. Who was <laughs> the number two pick, the number three pick? It should have Peyton Pritchard outplayed the shit out of him tonight. So um how like the these guys, it's this game means absolutely nothing for anyone. Especially Portland probably wants to lose, but that's besides the point. They're like running offense. They're executing the defense. They're all making smart decisions. And it's like that is coaching. You you look at, like, even in past years, the Celtics deep bench guys. Remember under Udoka, how many times did oh, the dang. starters have to come back in? Um, that's I, I can't remember one time that's happened this season other than really the Kings game. But, again, that was kind of just goofiness and deer and Fox hitting everything. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it should, but apparently it hasn't helped his Coach of the Year candidacy. <laughs> yeah, really weird. It's gone the other way. And, firstly, Ben, the, the spin zone from you – I mean, you've been on fire. You've been talking me off all kinds of ledges, just spinning everything in a positive direction. And to spin the last two games as this is actually another feather in the cap of the Joe Missoula Coach of the Year ballot. I mean, it's just fucking beautiful work. Like, you know, but but I think you're right. It's it just not, you know, all, not all spin is, is factually incorrect. I think you're onto something here. Like, hey, this, the Kings needed that game. He pulled the starters with like, like, eight, seven minutes to go with a 16-point lead. That's nothing in today's NBA. And, like, the Kings are a solid team in the West, above 500 team, fighting for their playoff lives, going against a double bigs lineup of Luke Cornett, Xavier Tillman, Svee Mikhail, Luke Peyton Pritchard, and Sam Hauser. I mean, Spoonie, you missed the most important comp of them all. Sam- Joe mazzola has got Sam Hauser look- looking like Carmelo Anthony out there. Yeah, that's I mean- right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, um, so like, yeah, you're onto something and like to generate these, this level of vibes, like you kind of like thought it wouldn't be possible because the vibes have already reached, you know, cataclysmic levels. And how, how can I, how can I unlock a new, unlock a new level? Well, maybe I just use the third stringers to get some of these W's. So Chris Tapp's composing is can walk up to the second level and have some beers with the, with the people from Massachusetts. And he's just walking into the crowd in the middle of the Kings game, having a beer, <laughs> having a, having a smoke with some of the guys in the second row. Like everybody's just having the time of their life. And, and while also managing everybody from an injury perspective, no one's playing the fourth quarter. Chris Tapp's Porzingis is out here fucking averaging a five by five game. If, if they would let him play the fourth quarter, like this is incredible for games that like I was out. I'm like, let's just end the season. And I'm just, these vibes were best time. Yeah. So speaking of cataclysmic level vibes, Chris <laughs> Porzingis, who some say is still in the, the garden stands today, celebrating and smoking cigarettes <laughs> with the crowd. He looked like he did not want to leave that position. He was like, I'm good here. You guys keep playing the game. This is in the Kings game, of course. Uh, he was so comfortable up there in the stands, just like a god, like wading into the crowd at some sort of rock and roll concert. Yeah. Clearly, as I say that, I make it evident that I've not been to many rock and roll Rock shows. and roll crowds, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, love it. But Porzingis in this one, 12 points, 10 rebounds, gets the double-double, but eight stocks. And I feel like the stats team weren't even particularly generous with, with some of those blocks that he had in this one. He continues to trend in the right direction. A few podcasts ago, we were sort of saying, okay, what are we what are we really looking for during this 
juncture of the season to make sure that there's playoff readiness, both obviously within the team, but from us and our emotionally uh, stable standpoint. And it was Kristaps Porzingis finding his playoff form and rhythm and tenacity. And he continued that in this game. Not as many uh, attempts, just seven field goal attempts, but only 27 minutes as well, which is a huge win. Uh, one of three from three, but the the confidence in the shot, the one that he knocked down was just dead eye. Uh, and anything close to the rim on either side of the ball uh, just looks shit hot right now, Spoonie. So are you feeling good? Like it has... The final I being dotted and the final T being crossed for you, as far as concerns with this guy. Uh, yeah, I think I think I'm good with KP. And look, the Blazers starters shot 37 and a half percent from two, uh, <laughs> and I think <laughs> which is like impossibly terrible. And I feel like that 22 <laughs> offensive rebounds is kind of fake because if you miss like a thousand shots, you're gonna get some offensive rebounds. But that number, I think you, a lot of it you can contribute to Porzingis, who was just like everywhere defending shots multiple efforts on single possessions too which i think is really important like you'll see rob used to do this sometimes where he'd like go or get a shot block or really affect a shot but he pulls himself like so far out of the paint sometimes that it'd be like an easy rebound um and kp doesn't do that he's just he's so freaking tall he just kind of stands there and he's like moving his feet really well mm. I think when it comes to like the rim protected shot side and like turning around and just like maneuvering around the basket and around bodies um, when he's defending shots and defending multiple efforts. So, yeah, he I mean, look, he like barely, he did was not an involved offensive game for KP and who who gives a shit. Right. He's been yes. he's been destroying yeah. recently. It doesn't care. This is what we want. Um, but, yeah, I'm good. I'm like I want the playoffs to start tomorrow with the way KP is playing defense right now. Yeah, dude, this is awesome to see him dominate a game this way. Like, he goes three for seven from the field. One, the fact that he only took seven shots, obviously yeah. only played 27 minutes, but that's kind of interesting. And, uh, yeah, you can't read too much into the, the box store stuff, but, like, Jalen Brown, 17 shots, and then your next leading shot attempt guy is Peyton Pritchard with 13 and Derek White with 13. So, weird from that perspective, but he just absolutely obliterated the rim, the paint. From a rebounding perspective, he's been really fucking good lately too. Like we had those two Atlanta games where it felt like the Celtics had gotten to the point where they were just deciding, okay, we've locked up everything. We're kind of taking the foot off the gas here. And that was seen with the defense and the rebounding, especially from Chris Apps's perspective. And from that game on, so he has five boards and seven boards in the uh, Atlanta games. He has 10 against... The Pelicans, 7, 12 against OKC, 11 against the Kings, and then he has another 10 rebounds tonight. So he's absolutely made it a focus after those couple of games, which is just great to see. And they, they've they been quite pointed with his physicality and how yes. they're going to need that from him. And, I mean, this, again, blazes. But, hey, DeAndre Hayden, he was the best. He was the starting center on a finals team. So for our purposes tonight, we can spin that in true Ben Vallis fashion here to like, spin hey, zone. hey. That's pretty impressive to, to dominate the paint like that against, like, do our brief Australian legend goes 0 for 5 <laughs> from the field. Um, you know, a lot of that to do with KP. Like, yeah, man, five blocks in 27 minutes to go with the 10 boards, the two, two assists and the three steals. Just completely, st very Rob-esque, honestly. Yeah. Like, not the field goal stuff because he's you know, shooting from further away. But, man, great game. Speaking of Rob... He apparently requested yeah. no tribute video, which uh, is a pretty uh, it's a pretty gentlemanly move because he's there with a few other ex Celtics as well. And didn't want to be like um, put up on a pedestal, I suppose. But um, that was interesting because I was ready. I had some emotions tucked away, mm. ready to unleash in that moment, and we just never got it. So maybe we'll have to manufacture our own um, Time Lord tribute video. But um, just before we get on to Peyton Pritchard and the Stay Ready crew a little bit more, some comments in the chat here from Jamie D, the main Celtics. Up 14 with six minutes to go. to go to the G League Championship. I've got the box score up, so we're going to keep an eye on that live Let's here. Go, on the pod here. And then Derek in the chat asking, uh, who do you guys want to face in the first round heat or sixes with Embiid? We're going to get to that later in the show. So we're going to rattle off some more post-game takes. Then we're going to get to Lizard Brain takes, uh, a Wayne Spoonie invention, which is a terrific segment. And then we'll finish up with uh, the playoff and seating <laughs> talk and that kind of thing. But Peyton Pritchard, was this like the biggest 
throbber of a PP game, guys, because I, I had some feelings about it during the game. Uh, I just, you know, is a mid-range god. He continues to put up numbers and he continues to answer prayers that we had for him prior to this season and earlier in this one, which is like, if you get into that little pocket of space, if you if you crack your defender off the dribble and they're, they're playing drop coverage and they're... Um, not coming up to defend you around the free throw line. You got a pocket of space there, buddy. Let that shit fly. And he's letting that shit fly. It looks incredible, Jake. That PP is flying around. I love it. Oh boy. 20, 20 points, three boards, eight assists on 69% shooting from the field. You you, you love you love to see that for from Peyton Pritchard. This is his time of year, baby. March, April, it was yeah. like as soon as the fourth quarter started and everybody was benched, he turned into Portland P. pro MP, quick twitch P we got in the chat here from Eric Weiss. Like, it's it's his time of year. Delano Banton versus... I, I joked about the Delano Banton versus Peyton Pritchard duel and, we, I mean, we kind of got we the got, Delano Banton versus, <laughs> versus Peyton Pritchard duel. Delano Banton, 28 points on 23 shots. I mean, looking pretty fantastic. But, I mean... Pritchard, I think you can say objectively took a leap this year. I'm torn on how incredibly Pritchard's playing across March and April because I'm like the captain of the March, April doesn't matter bandwagon, especially for a team like the Celtics and a team like the Blazers. So I'm kind of, you know, torn on it. But spin zone, you know, this is, this is, these games matter for Peyton Pritchard to build confidence going into the playoffs. The, the shot that I've been begging him to take has been the mid-range shot, using that Nash dribble, finding the little TJ McConnell spots. And man, he he man, he went straight at Delano Banton early in the game, crossed him over, pulled up in the mid-range. And that's a shot I knew he could make and he has been making. So like, I mean, you add the playmaking stuff. He's been, we've talked about the assist to turnover stuff, but that number's actually come down a little bit. But I think part of that's because he's actually been so aggressive. I think that's actually been as a, a positive. He's been more impactful from a scoring and playmaking perspective. And so that's I think it's going to bring that number down a little bit because he was just being so conservative with the ball. Whereas now he's like really penetrating the defense and, and it's getting the offense moving. Yeah. And I mean, he just looks so strong, vascular, veiny. Uh, <laughs> you can take <laughs> pills for that kind of PP growth. I hear. Yeah. Uh, but so like since January one, right? March, April doesn't really matter. But since January one, he's averaging 10, three and a half or 3.3 with 0.8 turnovers on 48, 38 shooting. So like That's he's good. balling out of control since March started. But like since January one, that is like one of the better bench players in the NBA for those in 22 minutes. So He's been awesome for a long period of time. And yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Jake. Like we checked his assist to turnover ratio, I think on the playback and we're surprised yeah. it had dropped into like four or something, but it is because Still, yeah. he's doing more. He's got a bigger burden, uh, creation burden now with the ball, which is a good thing. That's what we want from him. And yeah, he had like one mid range in that fourth quarter where he just like shrugged somebody off of him and then rose up and sank it. And I think Scal was like, you know, I've been talking about like what I want to see and what Peyton Pritchard would look like at his very best. And I think we're just kind of seeing it now. Like this dude is <laughs> yeah, so yeah. freaking good now. It's crazy. <laughs> like what is he even averaging in, in like late March, April, it's gotta be like 17 and six or something insane like that. So I, I mean, he was a game high plus 19 second best in the game was plus 10. So like he he's impacting the game really on both ends because his defense is really solid these days too, like his point of attack stuff. He's getting around screens really well. So, I mean, this he's just like balling out, dude, every game now. And that's what you want to see. Like every, you know, every bench guy, the 15th man on a random team can get hot and have a 20-point game, 25-point game here and there. But it's the consistency that really matters. And Pritchard's kind of finally found it, which is super important. Yeah, dude, on the, on that last 10 games, 13 points, three boards, five assists on yeah, over on 51.5% from the field. Yeah, dude, that's like a le- fucking legit bench player. 13 points per game. It's no yeah. joke, dude. Hell yeah. We're so spoiled. 
We're having a good time. This was a fun game. Uh, the stock exchange <laughs> were really good as well. Derek White, sneaky nine assists. And overall, the Celtics, they had 34 assists on 49 made shots, which uh, one of you kindly put in the run sheet here. Ties for the third most assists in a game uh, this year. Drew Holiday hit two of his three three-point attempts. He's just looking pretty comfortable oh, and settled in after that whole AC joint issue and someone else who was looking comfortable is x-man the big tea bag xavier tillman um starting to really settle in here the the argument i think is well and truly alive as to whether or not he should be getting these three-point oh, attempts God. off um he, he snubbed a couple of corner three-point attempts but then heroic you might say bank shot just controlled bank use the glass expertly <laughs> elite just big man control tim duncan-esque you might say, but yeah, from beyond from the, the arc. So the... more like a, really a modernized, realized yeah. version of He's Tim Duncan's Duncan, potential. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh, Spoonie, we'll start with you, Jake. I know your take is, is well and truly documented on this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys sort of sided against me on this, on whether or not you should be <laughs> shooting those three. So are you starting to come around to the light, Spoonie, or do you still think he should, um, <laughs> he should be leashed? <laughs> I, I think so. I, I don't think I'm quite as against it as Jake is. And I think I think like if it's a playoff game and we're relying on Xavier Tillman to space out to the corner, it's like, what the hell are we doing? But on the flip side, it's like I think they are anticipating Tillman kind of being that Al Horford replacement long term. Like I anticipate we'll sign him up. We have his bird rights. I can't imagine he's going to get like a full mid-level offer in the off season. So it's a skill that if he can develop, it turns him into an entirely different player and it's March or it's April who gives a shit fire away X (laughs) fan. But if he takes one in the playoffs, I'm not going to be happy. So he is four for 19 now on the, on the season as a uh, Celtic. So Mm. 21.1%. And that includes the one that he made today. And if you weren't in the playback room, here's, here's Xavier Tillman. Knocking in some bullshit. Oh, oh no. man. Here we go. Off the break. Oh, that was oh <laughs> never in doubt. Let it rip. Fuck <laughs> off. How can you Fuck tell that guy not to shoot? How Fuck can off, Jack. I, I was like, like Jackson Moon's going to be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jack just dunking on you, Jim. I know. He got <laughs> yeah. he's at the game, Jack Simone. How about them Celtics legend? He like he saw, he knows he's got like sixty seconds to get from there into the playback chat room and he's just all caps. It. Suck it. And every time Tillman hits a three, he's tweeting at me now, which I absolutely love. But you're just I, I think that's a point for me. That's the type of three point shooter we're working with, is that he hit that thing like <laughs> basically off the shot clock and that thing went in. But hey, it led to the positive vibes. He had a couple of really nice cuts to the rim, around the rim, which I like to see more. He was four for seven, one for two from three. So, hey, I, I'm i standing on this hill. I'm refusing to move uh, until, until I'm proven otherwise. <laughs> Incredible vibes. It's just crazy that we can continue to be surprised by things and, and find things with the Celtics to sink our teeth into at this point in April with everything well and truly locked up. Uh, I want to make sure that we showcase some more of those vibes from the playback room right now. We've got an incredible uh, Stay Ready Crew play led by Peyton Pritchard on the fast break. Yeah, that's fair. Which I think is a... F- oh! 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 Behind Stay the ready, back. crew! <laughs> Very ready. Amazing. Good times. <laughs> Sign up. Playback.tv slash Celtics blog if you want to get in on the fun. If you think it's good now in April, imagine what it's going to be oh, like man. in the playoffs oh, yeah. going forward. We're going to come back in a moment and do our lizard brain takes on this Celtics team in April. But first, here's a quick word from our sponsors. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. March is over, but the biggest moments of college basketball tip off in the month of April. Be a part of the action on Prize Picks for both men's and women's college basketball and get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. You can even make the play-in rounds like seem interesting since we all know the Celtics won't be there. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what make prize picks the number one fantasy sports app. Personally, I'm looking at Derek White more on points because they are criminally low and we all know Derek White is going to come 
come up big in the postseason. So download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Thanks to our sponsor, Prize Picks. Download the app, use that code CLNS. $100 first deposit match. Pretty solid there. A little bit of extra extra dosh to play with. And really, you can supplement your viewing experience there by by choosing um, all the, the wonderful picks that, that Prize Picks give you the option to, to get involved with. So, Spoony, I'm kind of um, I'm risking it here because we talked very briefly, briefly before we clicked that go live button that you might have a little Prize Picks uh, thing for us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we probably should talk about this before uh, <laughs> okay. I run it live. But here, I, I'll throw it out as an idea. You guys don't have to say yes. I have two hundred dollars in my Prize Picks account. I think once or twice a week, we each give a pick. So I'll say Derek White, you know, rebounds, okay. assists more. Jake says Derek White points, rebounds, assists more. Ben says Derek White stocks more. And then we, you know, tweet that out like Prize Picks promo code CLNS with my money. If we lose, I'll eat the loss. If we win, I'll give you each 10 bucks and I'll keep whatever the rest of the winnings are. Uh, and we just kind of, you know, as a way to get us out there a little bit more with prize picks and get oh, people yeah. playing along. And, you know, if one of us fails, we can, everybody can make fun of that person That's for right. having the wrong pick. And we just kind of, you know, do it throughout the playoffs a couple times a week. That's a great That's idea. Right. As long as I can choose okay. Xavier Tillman corner threes, uh, less or more, <laughs> then I, I'm in. But there you go, more folks. A little negative little... point five. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah yes. you're gonna get gonna get good odds on that one. Yeah, I think yes. it's a good competition. Who can who can win the prize picks battle? Hopefully, we actually make some money. We can use it on um, beers while we watch uh, Jordan Walsh play basketball in Las Vegas oh, in July. God. Which will be great. There you go, folks. You got a little behind the curtain uh, podcast crew meeting, <laughs> yeah. which I definitely should have run by Spoonie before bringing it up live <laughs> oh, on yeah. YouTube. But well handled, Spoonie. Well done. Uh, lizard brain take, Spoonie. What do you got for us? Okay, so if if you need a refresher, you haven't heard this before. Lizard brain takes is essentially pure emotional takes. Uh, they have no basis. Well, maybe some basis in reality, some basis in fact. Uh, and what ends up happening is one of us says one and then the other two basically tell the other person why they're wrong and shouldn't feel that way, which is what I want. I want to be told I'm wrong with most of these. So <laughs> my first one is like, I feel like Jalen's left hand is going to bite us in the ass at some point, whether it's due to injury or Miami heatitis, whatever that disease is. But I just like until he proves it and it's not a problem, I feel like teams can play him to that left hand even though he's been great with it this year. Like I tweeted out multiple amazing left-handed finishes years, but I just can't get at that out of my brain. Certainly doesn't help that he hurt his left hand last week <laughs> yeah. and that yeah. it's been <laughs> kind of weird since then. Yeah. Look, I think this whole experience of the season has been a little bit like that in a way. It's like as excited as I am for the playoffs, my brain can't fully wrap my head around what this team being this good actually means for the playoffs. Cause I'm just stuck in, that I had a six game, seven game, seven game playoffs last year, and then a, a four, seven, seven, six. Like, I only know pain, suffering, and excruciating anxiety in the playoffs. So, like, I can't like fully wrap my head around the team actually being markedly different in the playoffs, even though, like, objectively, this team is 10, like, almost 10 wins better than they were last year. Yeah. Like, just abs- absurd level of dominance across an incredibly talented. NBA they've lost three home games all season long which is like completely different to the team that went into the playoffs last year and the year before and so it's just that mental hurdle of like getting over this team being different and it's why it's a lizard brain take we don't actually yep. believe these things like because if you take a step back from your emotional self having these thoughts you're like they're just thoughts just let them wash over you focus on the task at hand go get some buckets yeah. Oh, well, the reason why I think you're wrong, Spoonie, is because there's, there's, <laughs> there's too many good things, too many options for us to go to for Jalen Brown's left hand specifically to be the downfall of it all. And I, first of all, I don't think the injury is that bad. Otherwise, because there's just no reason to have him on the court yeah. unless it's manageable or recovering or both. So, first of all, I don't think it's that bad. The fact that he even attempted a dunk in such a meaningless game tonight against the Blazers tells me how bad it is, which is probably not that bad at all. And then, like, even if Tatum's having a bad game, even if Paul Zingas is having a bad game, you've got Drew, you've got Derek White. We've seen what Peyton Pritchard and Sam Hauser have been capable of off the bench. There's just so many options. And all of that feeds into, and we've seen it all year, opening up 
Jalen Brown's capabilities and even just from an X's and O's perspective, the spacing and the options that he has uh, when attacking the opposing team's defense. So life is easier for Jalen Brown. He's better than he was last year. And our top six is just so fucking powerful that yeah. I refuse to believe that anyone's anyone's anything, hand, foot, whatever, it's not going to be the downfall of this team. So here I am again. I can't believe I'm, I'm playing this role Take lately. That. Last yeah, week no, so it's I've been wild. talking you guys off the ledge. It's insane, yeah. but um, that's why we call it Lizard Brain Takes. It's a, that's right. It's a good time. What else you got uh, for us? Yeah, keep going. Um, okay. One of Pritchard or Hauser is going to be terrible in the playoffs. <laughs> oh. I, okay. Yeah. So, hear, yeah. hear, hear me out. Like, Hauser, look, if the shot's not falling, he's just – he's a negative essentially in a playoff series. I don't think he's necessarily a negative in the regular season, but in a playoff series where teams will really focus in on the correct way to attack him, he needs to make shots. Maybe I, what did he go? One of 18. against Sacramento. Yeah. Maybe this is a little recency bias. And then Pritchard, it's like, okay, he's so much more aggressive. He's getting downhill, but like if teams are scheming for him and more aware of him, is he going to be able to do that? And then you just turn him into basically a shorter version of Hauser if he's not getting <laughs> downhill, if he's not attacking. And then the shots need to go down. So, again, lizard brain take. They've mm. both been friggin' awesome. I believe in both of them. I hope we lock up Hauser on a nice extension this offseason. But it's there. It's The nugget is there, deep down, yeah. buried. I think we probably get to a point where we're playing six guys. Yeah. that That's not – that's just – and that's fine. Like, and that's, you know, you're, you're kind of alternating the bigs, playing a couple double big lineups to make sure you get a little bit of rest here and there. Tillman's coming in. I, if I'm, if I think one guy's going to fail more so than the other, I, I, I tend to lean Pritchard being the guy that struggles just because of the size. I think, I believe in Hauser's shot. I thought it was just astounding that he was able to go it's one, wild. like one for a 12, considering yeah. how absurd of a shooter he is. He's like, the, like an eight year track record of being someone that shoots like 43% on high volume. So I'm like a believer. The fact that he did that last game and then came out today and shot two for four, going back to last year when he had that slump in November and he came out of it, I feel like as a shooter and as a young player, finding your way in the NBA, you're, you're going to go through a slump. I mean, how many slumps has Jason Tatum been through? And like the confidence to know that there's like that famous clip of Kemba Walker talking to maybe Grant Williams in the bubble of being like, next one's going in. Next one, confidence, confidence. And Kemba Walker, they kind of never started to go in again for him. But like, <laughs> but, but, but he believed. But, but he believed. And like, that's all that matters. And how's it came, how's it came out of that slump last year? And he has not had an extended slump at all this season. No. There's maybe been like a week or two, but nothing like he experienced last year. And so... I think that he's going to be fine. I think he's got confidence in his shot. I think the team has confidence in him. And just the size to kind of just being six foot seven, that's kind of the name of the game. Yeah, this is an, another great lizard brain take. And it's honestly, it's like becoming one of my favorite segments. We should do it more. But I think it, re it requires like Spooner, you you rocking up with all of these takes because the thing that I like about I it so it. much is you just like, bring me the takes and I'll react yes. to it. It's such it's a luxury. Beautiful. It's like sitting down for a delicious meal. But <laughs> you know, And this this one, I think, is one that a lot of people think about, like PP or Hauser. And maybe another angle on it is like, if you had to choose one of them mm. going into the playoffs, which one would you bring with you? And for me, it's Hauser just because PP... Obviously, way more dynamic offensively, but like he just will get attacked. He will get targeted in the playoffs. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And yeah, there's some matchup specificity with that, but ultimately, it's going to happen at some point along the journey. How's uh, his skill set? It's just a lot less targetable, I think. And, and you guys, you've done a really good job this year of like identifying exactly how other teams can target Hauser and getting him caught up in multiple screening actions and things like that. But Doc Rivens is just calling us all out it, of the chat he, here. Rivens hates <laughs> any and all PP slander. He's not enjoying this. Um, but, you know, Hauser, he's, he's money from three. We know this. He's a more than serviceable defender. And sometimes teams, I don't know if this is going to be the case at these playoffs, but teams target him to their detriment. He's, he's yeah. He looks, he appears targetable. The house trap, we call it. Um, but he just never is. So it's tough. It's tough to um, throw shade at PP, and I'm, I'm really not doing that. But it, it's Hauser for me. He's more of a sure thing this postseason. I, yeah, agreed. You got one, Jake, or I somebody said, I, else I, threw I, some in there. I, said, I, I chucked one in there. I don't want to confuse you. So actually, shout out the YouTube comments on, we clipped out the video of us talking about the best Celtics defender. And someone in there said, 
I actually think Tatum's defense is better than his offense. Oh, that's this is a good take. Spoonie, I, I throw it to you. Man, yeah. I think that's really tough because I think that his defensive role isn't as difficult as his offensive role. So, but like, do we think he's what maybe like the tenth best offensive player in the NBA? He might be the like eighth best defender in the NBA, but it's just so much harder to find a guy who can be a number one option on a true contender and be efficient. And like, he's averaging five assists a game, man. Like, that's a lot for a wing. Um, so maybe like straight up pure analytically yes his defense is better than his offense but i think if you look at it in the context of like what he's asked to do on offense compared to defense i just i, I just can't get there but it just highlights how friggin' awesome he is as a two-way guy that we ha- yeah you can even have the conversation yeah exactly I, i'd say his defense is lower variance and therefore more consistent when his offense is at its best his offense is better than his defense but his offense does fluctuate. We uh, I hate to admit it, but it does. Hopefully, it doesn't yeah. fluctuate at all in the postseason. But his defense doesn't really. His defense is always just like a notch above solid. So his defense might be, I don't know, like more important to the team uh, throughout the, the course of a regular season because we do have so many offensive options. Maybe. Maybe I'm stretching here. Offensively, when he's firing at all cylinders, there's no question the offense is better to me. Yeah. And look, just... There are the best players on the best teams have off shooting nights, and that's like the, the nature of offense, especially in the playoffs. I think a segment we could do, which would be good to like make us all feel a little better in general, is like the best player on finals teams, like just pick out all their worst games from their playoff run. And this was drawn to my attention when we talked to Cedric Maxwell because I was like, oh, fuck, Larry Bird had a six for 18 game. I thought he was, you know, impervious to games like that. Then I went back and looked, and he had like several games that were like that. So, yeah, I do agree that there is a variance thing, but that is just. It's the nature of being like one of those number one guys, especially in the playoffs, unless you're Jokic. I wonder what it would look like if like Tatum was a role play. Like Tatum was Herb Jones, you know, like yeah. it's like you, you're you not allowed to do the off. Like you, you've got your rookie Tatum role on offense. You're a catch and shoot corner guy, uh, role guy. And then on defense, we're asking you to do everything. We're asking you to use all of your energy, guarding all the best players and, and, really focus on the rebounding more than you already do, which is a lot. I do wonder if we're talking like about him being one of the best defenders in the NBA and being in the in the conversation for, for defensive player of the year and, and one of those guys. But I think Spoonie, you're right. Like it's just so hard to find a guy that can do what he can do on offense. So like as far as value goes, you can find more guys that are in the same stratosphere Tatum wise on defense. And so offense is just more important, unfortunately. Yeah. Not he would be, he would be like that Spurs young Kawhi mm. if he did that, where it's like fourteen a game and just like absolutely insane. We've almost never seen this before style yeah. wing defense. Yeah, great um, comp. Yeah, uh, Jake, I I have I have one from our Discord. Um, Here you go. from our our guy Tice, who's also a Reddit mod. Shout out Tice. He dropped some awesome analytics in the Discord that I don't absolutely. think he posts really much anywhere else. So definitely join. Are we the 64 win Suns from 21 22 who won obviously 64 games and they lost in the second round? So I pulled some stats. They had a 7.5 net rating. We're at like 11 and a half or something like that. Jake, I believe in the Discord, you called them clutch game merchants. Which yeah. is like, <laughs> I knew that was like the prevailing narrative, but like it is insane how much they were clutch game narratives. They had a plus 33 net rating in the clutch. Second best team that year was plus 16. So like double better than the clutch than anyone else. And they were 33 and nine in clutch games. So they shot a ton of mid-range jumpers and did not shoot threes. So while maybe on the, the only thing that really looks similar is the win record uh, for these teams. Like, we're just totally different offensively than they were. And also, like, they had Booker and they had Chris Paul, and you can exploit those dudes. And Luka Doncic owned them in that mm-hmm. playoff series. We just have nobody you can exploit like that, especially not important players who play, like, 35-plus minutes in a playoff series like that. So I do not think we are the Suns from 21-22. But that is such a lizard brain take to be like, are we going to lose in the second round because this other team won 60 games and did? I love I love this. Um, I'm trying yeah. to find the uh, 
is it the, is it the 21 22 season i think or oh, the 2021 season they are the 20 21 22 21 22 there we go i just want to find their um their defense yeah they they were the third in defense i just wanted to check their defense um i think you use hindsight with this team and like knowing what we know now about deandre ayton saw him tonight um kind of soft and a fraud and they absolutely were clutch game merchants and what's funny about that is like you want to be incredible in the clutch look at Denver right but the difference with that that team and Denver is Jokic doesn't grind down in the playoffs Chris Paul has been incredible and was incredible in the clutch for his entire career every team he was on he was just like and that's why everybody wanted the Celtics to trade for Chris Paul every year because it's like that is objectively maybe the thing that he was the best at in his NBA career. The problem was when he gets to the playoffs, he's a six foot guard and he was in his mid to late thirties and started to grind down. And so in a regular season, that's going to be something that he's easily going to be able to do. You orchestrate all these games and he ends up winning a lot of them, but then that just doesn't translate to the playoffs. And yeah, Booker, not on the same level as Tatum, Chris Paul, like he, 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 he missed time throughout that playoffs as well he was completely a different guy by the time he got to the finals like just we have guys that get stronger as series go along all of our guys are in their prime 26 27 giant athletic wings completely different but yeah all the wins aren't going to feel so like they meant that much if we lose in the second round (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah that's definitely the most terrifying take that's being put forward in this segment I i think the other contextual factor that needs to be considered is the playoff experience from our leaders in the Jays in that you know they've had so much playoff experience they've lost in every imaginable way at this point including you know you could argue due to injury against the heat in game seven last year and just flaming out and having their offense just die in the ass uh in important series against you know admittedly better coach teams they've lost in all all different kinds of ways and they're I think they're ready to win in the right way. They know what their approach is supposed to be. And that level of chemistry, you just couldn't attribute that to that Suns team. So that's what I'm thinking as I roll over and try and get back to sleep after having that thought <laughs> pop into my mind <laughs> in the middle of the night. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, it, ben, does, it does lead again. me to one lizard brain take, uh, and that is the one the one person that you can maybe exclude from like playoff readiness, chemistry. They've seen it all, mm. and I've touched on this, so we don't have to spend too much time on it. But Kristaps Porzingis is he ready for the spotlight? Is he ready for the moment? Does he understand, you know, his utilization of himself and of his teammates? in a playoff setting and how teams will scheme against him, be really physical with him. They'll identify his biggest weaknesses and try and exploit all of them at a really high level. And then just the physicality of the playoffs. Can he last through something that is hopefully only 16 games long, Uh, which even that at playoff intensity is is incredibly grueling. So like, can he make it and should we be be concerned? I think is a, a valid lizard brain take. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a terrifying one. I will say from like the <laughs> the br- the lights being too bright, all I needed to see was game one against yeah. the Knicks when the yeah, whole sure. stadium's booing them. And the Knicks have some of the, like, if the Celtics don't have the best fans in the NBA, it's the Knicks. Um, that place was going crazy. And he just slapped that big Latvian thing on the table <laughs> and put them away, dude. It was over. Like he, and he enjoyed every second of it so from that aspect of it i am not worried but i think what you're describing ben is like i'm more worried about him being schemed around defensively because what you just described offensively about who who cares if he's like goes you know five of 11 like we have tatum we have brown we have Derek white we have drew holiday we have you know horford's going to be good for a couple 20 point games in the playoffs pritchard and hauser will get hot for a couple games like we don't really need his offense almost as much as we need the threat of his offense combined with his elite rim protection. So I think the physicality, I think he's up for it, man. I think he's ready to go. Um, But yeah, like he has not played. He's, I think I saw that he's played the least amount of playoff games of anyone in like the top eight uh, other than I guess probably Hauser um, and definitely the least in the top six by a long shot. So it's, it's, I think it's a legitimate concern, but I think what he showed this year is he's ready for it and he's up for it. Yeah, but part of that is because the, we have like an absurdly experienced top six of playoff yeah. guys, of top five of playoff guys. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember doing 
running all the playoff appearances back on with the the net before the net series and like between Horford, Tatum and Jalen or it, it was just like we have so much experience. I think the answer to that question is almost just Al Horford. Mm-hmm. It's like if Porzingis is having a tough game, tough quarter, it's Al Horford time, dude. Yeah. He's, Al, it's my and favorite then, time. Al Horford time. <laughs> Al, Al, KP gets to come, relax, chill out, and I really think they're onto something talking about the scheming around him defensively. Using like the double big lineup, like Horford is like your main drop defender and like Porzingis is roaming off kind of whoever. I think there's just so much size and length between them. And then you've got Drew and Derek and Jalen and Jason. Like I just think, I think the defensive floor and the versatility can really make up for some of that stuff. And then, yeah, if he's having a tough time, I've maintained that if we lose Porzingis for the whole playoff run, we could still make the finals because of how good this team is. 19 and three without Porzingis this year. That's which absurd. Is nuts. That's crazy. Nuts. Oh, nuts. Man. So I it hasn't mattered. As long as we don't lose Derek White, that's the only guy we have uh, that's missed games that we don't have like an absurd winning record for. We're, we're good to go. That's a good point. I can't wait for the playoffs, man. So many spicy options. And as an attempt to segue to seeding watch, I'll just quickly, uh, just left the G League. This is from Cal J in the chat. Just left the G League main Celtics semifinals game. Sees win. Walshie and Neem had a banger of a game. Main sees to the finals. Finals oh. bound. If that doesn't bode well for the main Celtics, as in the primary Celtics, not the main Celtics, um, then I don't know <laughs> what... Doesn't anyway. <laughs> All right. I just tied my brain in a knot with that one. Yeah. Uh, let's let's get one more lizard brain take off the ground here as an attempt to segue to seeding watch. And this is from Derek in the chat from earlier. Uh, Ask um, who do you guys want to face in the first round? The Heat or the Sixers uh, with Embiid? So I think this is fair to encapsulate within lizard brain takes because you know I just talked about getting my own brain tied in a knot, and I think that's an easy thing to achieve when thinking about how either of these matchups could go. For me as much as there's heat PTSD, the heat have just only demonstrated shite really consistently all regular season. Whereas the Sixers and Bede comes back suddenly they look pretty damn good again. And Embiid's had a really high turnover rate, but his efficiency elsewhere on both ends has been really solid. He looks gassed, but it looks like we, if we do face him in the first round, his conditioning is only going to be better then than it is now. And that concerns me a lot. The Miami Heat just don't have that level of player or force that they can throw at us. So for me, the preference feels weird to say this out loud, but it's, it's going to be the Heat. What do you reckon, Spoonie? Okay, so first off, I ha- another lizard brain. I'll answer this one with a lizard brain take. <laughs> I've had this weird feeling for a while that we're just going to play the Bulls in the first round. And I have absolutely no, there's no facts or rationality to back that up. I just have had that feeling for some reason. But that said, I'm with you, Ben. I think it's got to be the Heat, even though, and we talked about it a little bit last last show. Um, they like Jimmy Butler just doesn't quite look athletically as good as he has in years past, even though he's you know takes every other game off practically. And look, we're all scarred from Caleb Martin shooting fifty percent from three and Gabe Vincent shooting forty percent from three, and it's like at some point it's going to stop happening. Like, this can't – I know, I know. It's like LeBron's going to retire eventually. (laughs) The devil magic has to expire at some point. And I feel like this is probably the year. Like, Lowry's gone. He's super annoying. He always did dumb shit that would, you know, steal his team possessions late in games and stuff like that. And I just – Hero doesn't really worry me, like, with our personnel to guard him. And he's been hurt, so who knows what he's going to look like. Um, He just seems like he's always banged up these days. And – like KP is the answer to their zone period. Like we've, we've shredded their zone when they've tried to run it against us this season. So for me, it's the heat just because Embiid, although Embiid has never been the better player in a series than Jason Tatum, he does have the ability to be. I think it's to me, it's become very clear that the Sixers have the highest ceiling of any team. That's not a Celtics team. The Bucks have shown us who they are throughout the season. They, they lost again today. (laughs) <laughs> they do, they did. Okay, so Middleton went out again today with a face uh, smash, ouch, um, which is that the medical term? That's the technical yeah, term for it. <laughs> and I actually was watching it live. I was like, oh, he's fine. And then he left the game. So he's out again, but they, they lost, the, they lose to the Knicks and they're going to fall 
like all of a sudden the Cavs went from the three seed to the five seed today, but the Sixers to me have the highest ceiling clearly um, in the East. They are really deep now. Like they don't even have Melton and Covington back and they kind of go nine deep. And if you get him back, that team actually looks really, like pretty solid. Again, Celtics clearly the more talented team, but like it might be the perfect storm finally for the Sixers where Embiid's back. He's as healthy as he's ever going to be. The conditioning's going to be a problem for him. Like, especially if we play them in the first round. Um, there is my lizard brain take is like, would you rather play the Sixers in the first round or the Eastern Conference Finals? It's like, I think the right answer is the Eastern Conference Finals. But like, if the Sixers make it to the Conference Finals, that means that he's playing well, they're playing well, and you're probably getting the actualized version of them. Whereas you play them in the first round, you're probably you're getting them in the, at their weakest stage before you get there. But yeah, the the Sixers are at the top of the don't want to play list in the first round, I think, t- at that at that point, and you s- let the chips fall where they may kind of after that. Yeah, and with the with Embiid getting to the conference finals, hypothetically, is it conditioning? Is he ready? Is he ramped up at that point? Or is it too many miles on the legs, you know, given you know how he got to that point with missing so many games this regular season? Is it to his advantage or to his detriment at that point? Which is what makes it just a classic lizard brain take because it's just like, oh my God, there's so many thoughts and feelings <laughs> swirling around my mind. Um, they'll win the play-in tournament if they end up in the play-in. And so they'll play the two seed. Again, segue. Might not be the Bucks in the two seed as they've just yeah. lost to the Knicks 122 to 109 as we move to seeding watch to to round out this pod, guys. The Bucks, I have been like a full, full subscriber of their subreddit and and Twitter, <laughs> and their <laughs> mental gymnastics after these losses have been like, you know, our, our starting five are really solid together. Of course, we're going to show up against good teams. You know, the Wizards, the Grizzlies, these guys that we've lost to. It's just not worth getting out of bed for these performances now you're at risk of dropping out of the two seed you're coming up against a solid Knicks team who has OG and Anobi back they're a good team worth getting out of bed for worth bringing your all your fight against and they've just shot the bet against them as well so Bucks are in an absolute free fall Uh, they're going to fall to and through the ground and out the other side and leave the earth's atmosphere through the bottom of the planet is how rapid their demise is but um seating watch currently as I try to look at our run sheet here it's Stop just the sense I filled out the run sheet. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, the yeah. sixes, the sixes were up one with six seconds to go against the Spurs, and oh shit, <laughs> old friend, I think Julian Champagne just hit a three, and no. now there's three seconds left, and the sixes are down two, and they have a timeout. So it's like, how the fuck is Julian Champagne the guy? Because if they lose this, I think that it's going to be tough for them to to get out of the play in. Um, I've uh, it's they're about to inbound it, but it's a it's kind of just changing so much every day. But the fact that the Pacers beat the Heat today, the Heat look like garbage. They're the secret thing about the Heat is that Hero's back this time, and I think that he actually makes them worse. Mm. Yeah, he's got somebody you can pick at on the defensive end every single possession. Sixers win. Sixers tie it. All right, Ooh. all right, let's go. Oh, time. All right. We gotta get, get back to the, the playback, play boys. Yeah. yeah, we gotta get out of here. Um, <laughs> hey, the real quick on the Cavs, they're 11 and 17 in their last 28 yeah, it's games. Awful. Oof. That's insane, well, dude. What was that run they went ball. on? It was like 17 and one at some point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's 17 crazy. and one. When, when Garland got hurt, yeah. they ripped and off Mobley. a ton of wins. And Mobley, they ripped off a ton of wins, and then those guys came back and they suck. Which tells me, I mean, Mitchell's probably gone. This is going to be a disaster. I feel yeah. bad for the Cavs, but like I love Garland. He's just not a dude you can build your team around, unfortunately. No. So that sucks. Hopefully the Sixers get out of the play-in game. But this true. is chaos, dude. This next true two ho- weeks true. is going to be awesome. True, true holiday true. for Donovan yeah. Mitchell trade. Oh. 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 I feel uh. like well, Drew's thirty-five. Like you got to three. Whoa, to- Jesus! No, he, no, no, I think he, he just turned thirty-four. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right in the middle um yeah. so like i feel like just from an age perspective you kind of have to do that trade but the flip side is like drew fits what this team oh, needs from that position yeah. so perfectly whereas mitchell it would be kind of tough to fit him in but also it's donovan but fucking also mitchell. like the insane <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. jake <laughs> if there was an ombudsman for this industry like some sort of <laughs> industry based presence uh slap on the wrist for that day <laughs> at this How time you? you can't be putting the energy out there right before the playoffs I'm just, jake I'm just I'm just noticing. 
That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. Um, but yeah, yeah. No, they they. That's the. That's we want them in the four, the magic and them in the four or five. I think would be perfect because. I was kind of getting scared of the magic there for a little bit, but then they lost the Hornets in like a gotta have it game, and I was like, "Oh, well, you're a fucking fake." So um, mm-hmm. you're you're immediately out of my scared of ranking. So if we could somehow get the Cavs and the Magic into the four or five to line up like that second round series would be just chef's kiss. But I don't know, man. The Bucks could fall all the way down into that second round matchup too now. So like, yeah, who who knows at this point. And who's really, aside from the Sixers, as we've discussed, like who's really making a case to have any fear for at this point? And yes, the playoffs are different, and Giannis could go crazy in the playoffs. And that's uh, the one. Talking myself out of the take as I as I say it, but (laughs) really, like no one's no one's like you know putting up red flags from a Celtics perspective. Um, What I mean, as far as I'm looking at the run sheet here, second. What's the, what's the name of the, the segment again? Seating Watch? Thank you. Um, really nothing <laughs> nothing concrete as everything is literally changing before our eyes as we're recording this. So uh, maybe we'll just um, tie a bow on that and revisit it in a couple of days' time. Yeah, look. Sounds good. It's Thank God this is ending soon because every day is a fucking nightmare trying to figure out how I'm <laughs> supposed to feel about everything. Like I'm watching this Heat Pacers game at the beginning and like the Heat do something and I'm like, oh man, I don't want to play them. And Halliburton hits a pull-up three. I'm like, oh, I don't think I want to play them. It's just like, just rotate. And it's all nonsense. It's all nonsense. None of it matters. Because then I turn on to the Celtics and they can win games with the fucking Luke Cornett, Tillman, double B lineup. So who cares? Yeah, <laughs> Dude, Tillman's best two-man lineup is with Luke Cornett somehow oh, and net rating. Hey. It makes absolutely no sense. Joe Mazzula, coach of the year. Yeah, it's because Tillman is really, right. he's an elite spacer. Is what it comes oh, down yeah, to. Yeah, so yeah. You put him with any big, and it's buckets. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that seems like a good place to leave it yeah. before Jake yeah. can get a, a rebuttal in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for this one. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're live here in the chat or watching later on YouTube, thanks again for, for hopping on the YouTube channel. Please subscribe, hit that like button. If you're listening to the audio pod, please leave a five star review and rating and subscribe. All that good stuff. Spoonie, Jake, love your work, guys. Until next time, go Celtics. I love.